The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, this is Jillian Hellman, the CEO at Realty Mogul, and we're pleased to have you with us today. Before we kick off, I do want to provide a few requisite disclaimers. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only. There will not be an offer to buy or sell any securities. All securities-related activities conducted by North Capital Private Securities Corporation, a registered broker-dealer and member of FINRA and SIPC. North Capital does not make any investment recommendations, and no communication should be construed as a recommendation for any security. We may discuss private and public investments today. Private and public investments are speculative and involve a high degree of risk, and those investors who cannot afford to lose their entire investment should not invest. Private investments are highly illiquid, and those investors who cannot hold onto an investment for the long term should not invest. Information discussed today may include forward-looking statements and is for informational purposes only. Past performance is never indicative of future performance. With that said, I'm thrilled today to have Andrew Ribchinsky with us. Andrew is a managing consultant at CoStar Advisory Services, where he makes recommendations on investment in commercial real estate to REITs, pension funds, and other institutional real estate firms. Andrew's opinions and work have been published by the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and National Real Estate Investor. He has a background in data and spatial analytics and uses these tools to provide data-driven research for both clients and the wider market. His work includes conceiving of and coding scripts in SQL, R, and Python for in-depth analysis of commercial real estate to isolate factors that lead to outperformance. AKA, Andrew is one of the foremost experts in commercial real estate to tell us which markets are poised to pop and which are destined to doom. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for being on with us today. Thanks for having me, Jillian, and thanks for that uh, very positive um, description. <laughs> yeah, you've got a great background, and I'm excited to chat about you know what you do and how you do it and learn more about your view for what's going on in the commercial real estate world in, in light of what's going on with COVID. You know, we're recording this. It's June 26, 2020. COVID cases are spiking across the country. I know you and I chatted maybe a week and a half or two weeks ago, and the world felt a little different then than it does today. So really excited to catch up with you. And, you know, let's dive right in. You know, I'd love to start with understanding your perspective of this recession in light of COVID-19. You know, how deep do you expect it to be? How deep of a correction do you think commercial real estate will experience? Well, it's already been pretty deep. Uh, So job losses um, are worse than any event since demobilization in, in World War II. Um, and while we've gotten some good signals on a recovery, uh, it won't be immediate. So we're in agreement with with most economists on that. Um, there will be a prolonged return to its full employment. Uh, this will adversely affect CRE, of course. Uh, value losses, our forecasted value losses vary by metro and property type, of course. Uh, but within the property types, we are forecasting losses between 15 and 25 percent, peak to trough. Um, so retail's on the high end of that, and industrial's on the low end. Uh, these, and like I said again, so those are those are peak to trough losses, um, which are obviously significant. But I do want to mention again that we're we're expecting a prolonged recovery. So the CoStar Commercial Repeat Sales Index, um, which is our, our uh, publicly available pricing index, uh, indicates that pricing took a full seven years to recover, on average, um, from the last recession, and that average actually hides additional pain in retail and office that took closer to 10 years to recover. Um, and the Midwest region, which, as you know, as of two months ago, had barely even made it back to peak pricing. Um, so there, there could be a prolonged. Uh, there is probably a prolonged uh, recovery back to full pricing. Um, the reason for that falls on demographics. So we uh, demographics will impact recoveries um, in employment and CRE values. Uh, the working age population growth is slow compared to history. A country's aging and work participation rate among 65 plus workers just plummeted off of historic highs. And unlike 25 to 54 year old uh, participation rates, uh, a lot of those workers will probably not return. And places where demographics are particularly weak, uh, like the Midwest and certain markets within it, uh, there's a good chance that some assets will actually never recover their value. Interesting. Before we talk about specific markets, and that's really what we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about today, but let's talk about behavior change. So in your analyses, are you accounting for some percentage of the population that's going to be moving out of major cities due to the ability to work remotely? You know, I've been reading a lot about 
Facebook and Twitter and Square and Google and Zillow, and they've all announced that their employees will have more remote flexibility coming out of COVID. Many of these companies are going to allow their employees to be remote forever if they choose. So how is that impacting your analysis of, of certain markets? So I will say that our forecasts don't account for that, uh, unfortunately. Um, so the, the value lo- losses that I spoke of don't take that into account. Um, those value losses are predicted on cyclical and demographic factors. So a large behavioral change like that would not feed into them. Um, if more remote flexibility sent a flood of tech workers to Akron, our forecast would not catch that change. Um, but that's not to say that we're not considering that angle. So our office team believes that office is not dead. Um, and we do acknowledge, but we do acknowledge the effect of remote working and social distancing. Uh, remote working will change the function and importance of offices, but we don't predict their demise at this time. As such, uh, I do not expect workers to completely dissociate from where their workplace is by moving uh, clear across the country. Uh, there's a near universal belief that remote working will persist in the future. I think that's that's virtually undeniable, uh, but workers will. Uh, likely still go into the office to some degree, um, even as little and even as little as like once a month would keep them tethered to at least a region. I would agree that uh, some of those some of those tech like specifically tech workers um, may uh, push out further from from where they are previously located. Um, though I would argue that uh, cost in cost is not the only uh, function that that they'll consider. Um, Amenities are uh, very much uh, something that they'll consider as well. Uh, So our take is that increased remote working will unchain workers from close proximity to downtowns, but it will keep them within reasonable driving distance. A worker who goes in every other week can stomach a longer commute than than they once did, especially in exchange for more space or cheaper rent uh, or both. Uh, But in this scenario, a New York worker would not find it worthwhile to move to Baltimore even if rent was a third of the price. Um, we should also recall that commutes don't tell the whole story. And uh, c- cities and downtowns contain certain irreplaceable amenities um, that a non-negligible portion of the population will not want to give up. Um, if you polled Americans on their first choice on, on where to live, I would still expect New York to rank first, whether that you know, will be completely independent of their job. Um, our apartments.com search data does not suggest a vast outflow of renters from the Bay Area right now, uh, though I assure you that we are keeping a close eye on that. Uh, right now, economics seem to determine changes in search behavior. Uh, so poor performers include Houston, Vegas, Reno, Cleveland, and St. Louis, um, while Austin, Raleigh, San Diego, and Denver are all outperforming. Uh, so energy and tourism and manufacturing markets are suffering, while growth economies with uh, or growth markets with knowledge economies uh, have gotten better results, uh, which I might add is exactly what we would typically predict in a recession. Got it. Uh, When you combine a pan... Let's take one second there, Andrew, if you don't mind, because you you listed out a couple of markets there, and um, you you talk faster than me, which is amazing, and I love it, and I love that we're going to have a deep dive here. But I want to make sure that our listeners heard kind of those markets that, you know, I'm calling them destined to doom. So I heard Houston, Vegas, Reno... Cleveland and St. Louis. Would you say those are the markets that you're sort of most concerned about right now? Um, yes. Well, yes. So some of them I'm concerned about in the short term and some of them I'm concerned about in the long term. Um, energy and tourism markets are the short term issue. Uh, poor, uh, poor economic uh, results generally re- uh, result in lower uh, energy usage. Um, and of course, if everyone's working from home right now, seeing less driving. So we know what that's done to oil prices, and, and we know that oil firms have uh, felt a pinch. Uh, so that that hurts Houston, that hurts Oklahoma City, uh, and a handful of other uh, energy markets. Now, uh, tourism uh, also is more of a short-term concern. Um, obviously, we know that hotels and uh, and airlines are half full. Um, there's a lot of fear concerning the virus. And I I do think that long, I should say national tourist spots uh, are suffering as a result. Uh, So you you still do have people going basically within driving distance. Um, People, especially when they're remote working, uh, do have the ability to go someplace other than home still. Um, But long, 
those those big national hubs um, are also uh, inclined to have short-term pain. Now, some of the other two uh, two of the others that I mentioned there, Cleveland and St. Louis, those guys are in longer-term decline. Um, uh, they are doing worse in this uh, in terms of their search volume through Apartments.com. They are doing worse even than they were uh, a couple quarters ago. Um, but uh, when we, when we look at their demographics and their uh, their employment, uh, they've been suffering for a long time, and I, I would say that this is uh, this is just a continuation of that trend. Got it. I'm surprised Orlando's not on there. You know, given that it's such a, a tourist market. Now, in some respects, I kind of get it because I think Disney, you know, is is reopening and will reopen and will do what it can to stay open. But what are your thoughts on Orlando? So here's where I, uh, you know, admit. That I, I don't know everything because uh, I don't know why Orlando is not doing more, uh, doing worse. Um, the most of the high frequency data that I have access to does not show it falling off a cliff. It's um, it, it's not doing it's not doing well. Um, you know, it's it's not Austin or, or Raleigh, uh, but it's it's more or less holding steady. Um, I think that some of that is going to have to do with back office uh, work. Uh, it, it has been, uh, Florida in general has been pretty popular for uh, shifting back office work to, um, but uh, it, it is still highly, highly exposed to tourism. Um, so uh, I, I would have expected it to be doing worse. Yeah, very, very interesting. So let's talk about markets poised to pop or, or at least poised to perform better than the others. I heard Austin. I heard Raleigh. I heard Charlotte. What other markets do you think are going to perform well as a result of COVID and some of the changes to our economy, some of the behavioral changes? So those those three are, are very good um, examples. Uh, they are growth markets. Um, they have so they have less regulatory burden that has allowed them to uh, over outperformed through through much of this um, or through much of the last cycle, uh, which was the case with a lot of southern metros. But their additional boost is that they are also knowledge economies. Um, so they, in terms of educational attainment, um, those guys outperform not just compared to southeastern metros, but really on a on a national scale. Um, San Francisco leads the way in terms of educational attainment, but those guys are not far behind. Um, but some of the other ones that uh, have done pretty uh, are look to be doing pretty well on, on this high frequency data. Um, San Diego has been a, a real outperformer. Um, I think that some of that has to do with uh, the fact that it's a biotech hub, um, and that may just be perception. But uh, there is a there the two main biotech hubs for uh, the nation are Boston and, and San Diego, and um, San Diego actually uh, has a higher location quotient. Uh, for that aspect of employment. So I do think that that's allowed it to outperform. Um, the other one is Denver, which again is a growth market, uh, not quite the same level of regulatory uh, or non-regulatory burden uh, that, you, that you see in the Southern metros, but um, energy kind of helped it uh, for some time. But again, it's it's a knowledge market or it's a knowledge economy. You have a, uh, you have a good, number of educated workers there. And when we look at the economy of the future, uh, we, we've been trending towards more and more uh, educated workers in the workforce for decades now. And uh, we, we don't anticipate that slowing down. Right, right. Makes sense. Let, let's talk Texas. So Austin, it sounds like, is your favorite market in Texas. Uh, of the other you know, major metros in Texas, what, what do you like next? Is it obviously it's not Houston. We've talked about Houston, but is it San Antonio? Is it Dallas? What, what else in Texas? I would say it's probably Dallas. Um, San Antonio is also a pretty good bet, um, but Dallas has a uh, basically Dallas is big enough to weather this storm. Um, uh, I believe it's the fourth largest metro in the in the nation. Um, and it, it's built up that professional core that you that you would expect for a a major metro, um, which allows companies to operate uh, in the in the same way that they would for 
uh, New York or Chicago or LA um, because you have all of the accountants and the lawyers and the doctors um, that you would have in any other uh, part of the country and, and you have that ecosystem of um, uh, that ecosystem of, of professionals that allows uh, other professional companies to uh, outperform uh, or at least you know execute on their strategies uh, so Dallas uh, I would say is, is probably the uh, you know my my next bet in Texas. We haven't talked about Georgia much. What are your thoughts on Atlanta, other markets in Georgia? Yeah, Atlanta. Um, Atlanta is basically it, Atlanta has a very similar story to um, Dallas. Uh, again, it's it's big enough, and there is a uh, there's you know you've got that professional core there. Um, and it has a lower regulatory burden that allows it to draw in um, companies from outside. And I think when you look at uh, outperformance on population growth, uh, what you're really looking at is outperformance on um, uh, job growth. Uh, so the, the ability to attract businesses from high cost metros uh, into your lower cost and lower regulatory metro um, is what's driven Atlanta uh, to outperform uh, really for the past two decades or so. Um, and again, you've, you've got that professional core there now that allows uh, allows a major company to um, perform or perform their business the same way that they would in New York or uh, or LA. Um, so Atlanta Atlanta does pretty well. Um, I, w I I wouldn't say that it's it's better or worse than Dallas. Um, but uh, it, it's certainly a strong metro. Got it. We have a question from uh, one of our investors on the line around Seattle. What do you think about the Seattle mm. market and surrounding market? Yeah, Seattle, uh, well, so Seattle's another tech market, right? Um, but it it has, um, it does have a strong manufacturing uh, aspect uh, in terms of, in terms of Boeing. Um, and it's not, it's not quite as expensive as a lot of the, or as, as your, what you think of as kind of your core tech area in, um, in Northern California. Um, in general, we, we, you know, we haven't seen anything in Seattle that would indicate that it's, it's highly outperforming or underperforming um, going into this pandemic, or I should say in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, but in general, going forward, I, I would think that it's still a pretty positive bet. Um, obviously there's, there's some growth companies there, you know, Amazon being the <laughs> foremost example, um, that despite, you know, despite this trend towards remote working, I do still think that, uh, there will be office presences for a lot of, um, uh, a lot of those companies, uh, which, which would mean that those workers are still tethered to that, uh, at least region and probably Metro to a large degree. Um, which means that Seattle should uh, should continue to, to do pretty well. Yeah, makes sense. You know, you've produced some really interesting insights at CoStar about population growth and how that changes in typical recessions. In fact, I was reading, you know, one of your articles, which is what led you and I back to each other. Um, and I was just fascinated by it. So amazing work. And thank you for producing that. We're, we're obviously a co-star client and we spend a lot of money with you guys and we get a lot of value and, you know, we're constantly learning. And a lot of the work that you've produced is, is helping to shape our thoughts and our decisions and our investment policy here at Realty Mogul. So can you share the conclusions of that work on population growth and how, you know, this recession may be different than the 08 recession? Sure. Yeah. So the, uh, the results of, or the conclusion of, of that, um, of that analysis was that population growth in recession coalesces. Uh, so, at the peak of a at the peak of an economic cycle, uh, you have pretty wide differences between your fastest growing metros and your slowest growing metros. So, for example, we'll, we'll consider one of the one of the best and one of the worst. Um, Raleigh was growing at around four percent um, year over year. Uh, Re, uh, you know, as recently as, as last quarter, or two quarters ago, um, whereas LA was losing population, so it, it had negative population growth. Um, what we see in recessions is that the 
gap between those two uh, shrinks. So the so Raleigh still probably leads the way, but it's it might go down to, and I'm just speculating here, it could go down to 3% or 2.9, you know, uh, something like that, where LA might come back to 0%. So Raleigh's still the winner there, right? But uh, the, the gap between them um, go or shrinks a lot. Now, I, I actually, I, I would suspect that uh, that is going to happen again here. Um, and that, that goes back to my statements on job growth, uh, leading population growth. Uh, so when you, when you consider um, what metros are, are growing quickly, with the exception of certain Florida metros that uh, um, are attracting retirees, uh, most metros that are growing quickly are also uh, are growing their job base quicker, or, or I say quickly, but it lead, it's a leading indicator. Um, so workers uh, go there, uh, they, they have a job, and then they get married and, and have kids, um, which leads that population growth to kind of lag a little bit behind, behind job growth. Now, when we're in a situation where we've seen employment uh, well, employment tax, right? Um, but also a situation where companies are going to be nervous about uh, making big changes, which would include things like headquarter relocations or opening new offices in, uh, in new metros. That's going to slow down uh, the shift that you see between the two metros. Now, it's interesting. Uh, In an unre on an unrelated note, I guess, uh, on an unrelated note, those fast growth metros, uh, which also tend to be cheaper, do see better population growth on the basis of the fact that there are more children being born in those metros. Right. On a, on a person for person basis, there's just more kids being born there. Right. Uh, Andrew, but, sorry to, sorry to the, step in. We're having a little bit of an audio issue. If you can just adjust your headset, your audio is fading. Sorry. In a okay. Bit. Um, is, is this any better? Yeah, that sounds better. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the, uh, right. So the, the job growth aspect is, I would expect the job growth aspect that, that pushes Raleigh and Austin forward to slow down, but you still have that, that sheer population growth, um, that pushes them forward, uh, just based on the fact that it's, it's cheaper to, um, have a family and, and raise children in those metros. Uh, there's, I, Correlation is not causation. I'll, I'll comment that, but there is a very strong correlation between expense and the number of children per people in uh, uh, in metros across the country. So, so to recap that, what you're saying is that the in a, in a normal quote unquote recession in markets that had greater population growth, take it Raleigh that was at four percent, it may go down to three percent. But the gap between Raleigh and metros that, for example, had negative population growth like Los Angeles would shrink. So that would say, you know, Raleigh doesn't grow as much and maybe L.A. doesn't lose as much population. But do you, do you think that's going to be the case in with COVID? I mean, if you look at, you know, New York and L.A. and San Francisco, and maybe we can talk about New York separately, but are, are you expecting that same trend to happen again? Well, a, a similar trend, yeah. Um, and I, I, as I've as I've kind of, we've, we've been talking, you know, kind of dancing around remote working, um, this whole time. And it's, it's, it's obviously a big deal. Um, but I do think that those, those markets are still very big, uh, employment bases. Um, and I do think that remote working, uh, well, like I said, is at, like, it's absolutely a, um, a trend going forward, or I should say work from home, um, is a trend going forward, but we're not, Again, we're not predicting that um, offices become completely uh, completely unused. Uh, we we still we still think that a lot of workers will be tied to their geographical location, um, and even beyond you know basic stuff like retail or um, uh, you know uh, let's say service industry uh, work. Um, but you know we we include office in a lot of that. Uh, so. These those major markets uh, continue will continue to have big employment bases, um, 
and, and we wouldn't anticipate that uh, a majority of workers will be able to uh, work from literally anywhere. Uh, you know, we you did you know you rattled off um, a series of uh, tech companies that are you know can could be argued are, are leading the way on this, um, but I would argue that that's a pretty small percentage of uh, of total workers. Um, so most workers are still going to be uh, very location or geographically tied to their location. Right, right. Everyone is in the service business, right? If you're in the service business, you're going to be geographically tied and, and, and you know, you're going to have to show up. So that makes sense. What, what about Arizona? Let's talk about Arizona. You've seen significant population growth, you know, meaningful rent increases. I think it was leading the nation in rent growth, you know, for a number of quarters in this last run up. You know, what do you think about Phoenix? What about Tucson? What about Scottsdale? What, what are your thoughts on Arizona? I mean, I can't imagine the population growth continues at the same speed because, you know, there likely will not be as much job creation, but I'm curious where you think Arizona sits in this. Well, that is the, that is the problem. Um, the job, as I said, the job growth tends to be a leading indicator for population growth. Um, so as job growth diminishes, yeah, we would anticipate um, Arizona's population growth to slow. Um, but it's, it's kind of the it's kind of the short term versus the long term. You know, you, you asked about um, uh, like Houston versus Cleveland. Cleveland's in this long term slump, but Houston uh, the pain would be short term. And I kind of anticipate the same for Phoenix. Well, I, I shouldn't say kind of. I do anticipate the same for Phoenix. Um, it's it has been growing astronomically, and I, I think it's like the sixth or seventh biggest metro in the U.S. or maybe it's ninth. Um, but it's it's a huge uh, it has that same professional core that I was talking about for um, Dallas and, and Atlanta. Uh, so it's it's still got that draw. It's just that, as you said, when employment um, when employment is so uh, hurt right now, and and any employment growth is is really just recovering jobs. Um, I, I would I would anticipate that Phoenix uh, does slow down. But it, just like um, in the last recession, it was one of the it was one of the biggest hardest hit but it came back eventually and i would anticipate it doing the same got it makes sense I, i'm getting a couple of questions here about other specific markets andrew so we'll run through them but you know we, we can't expect you to be an expert on everything but if you have a position would would love to hear it so a lot of questions about nashville uh and this one is a really mm. interesting one for me because i was just reading yesterday that they are increasing property taxes in nashville 34 percent which from an investor perspective, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about those uh, real estate companies who didn't underwrite a 34% increase in taxes. I mean, we, we actually don't own in probably none of them. Um, yeah, there's none of them, right? I mean, that's definitely not standard underwriting. That's one of those things that, you know, unfortunately happens. Um, but would love your thoughts on, on Nashville. You know, is it overbuilt? I've been reading a lot about it's overbuilt. There's going to be too much supply, you know, specifically in multifamily, which is where we, you know, spend most of our time. Um, but what are your thoughts on Nashville? Is the job creation going to continue and the population growth going to continue as a result of that? Is it going to be totally oversupplied and in a world of hurt? So oversupply, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, Nashville was, of course, building a lot. And I actually, I mean, it was a few years ago now, but I just covered Nashville specifically. Um, so I, I, I like talking about Nashville still. Um, but the uh, over the oversupply in Nashville was focused on one specific part of the market, right? And that's pretty much the case for most metros. Uh, something like ninety, let's say eighty-five percent of of uh, supply still underway, and that's delivered over the last cycle has been delivering at the top end of the market. So Nashville will. Ex uh, and already has, of course, experienced pain from that uh, from that. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call it oversupply, but but high supply because that supply was predicated on uh, job or well job and, and population growth. Now, of course, as we as we hit this pandemic, it, it's oversupply. But um, two years ago, it, it it might not have been it might not have been. Um, uh, but the um, the overall I. I won't say that Nashville operates on the same level as Raleigh or, or Charlotte or, or Denver. The educational attainment is, is not the same, um, but you do still have that, uh, you know, that, that lower regulatory burden. And there, you know, 
it is more educated, I think, than the than the nation on average. I believe that's true. Um, so the uh, so the the ability to kind of focus on on that more knowledge economy um, is uh, is there, but it's uh, again, it's it's just not quite the 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 level of of Atlanta or Dallas, and uh, it's it's not quite the knowledge or educational attainment of of Raleigh or Charlotte. Um, so it's it's definitely going to suffer, I, I think, a, a little more. But again, it's it's one of those things where it's like, yes, it, it looks painful now. But um, on the other side of this, I, I think that it's one that comes back pretty strong. Yeah. Let's let's talk about the apartments.com data, because this is also really fascinating to me. And you wrote a really great piece around the apartments.com data. So CoStar owns apartments.com, which gives you access to the data, which is pretty neat. And you can figure out from the apartments.com data where potential residents are searching for a new place to live. So what is the data telling you? Are people moving as freely as they were this time last year? And then I read one of the analysis is that you did talking about you can track the IP address and the location of the search compared to the cities where prospective residents are searching in to tell you what cities people are most interested in moving to. So what is that data telling you? Yeah, that's a uh, it's very interesting data, right? Um, and I've I've been digging into it a, a fair amount recently. Um, so I, I think I already mentioned that some of the outperformers there are Austin, uh, San Diego, and Raleigh. Uh, so we, uh, the, the comparisons that I ran here are, um, what is the share of population, or what is the share of searches that are coming from outside the metro compared to the last quarter, and what is the share of searches originating inside the metro that are looking other places compared to last quarter? And so what I've, uh, you know, what, what it tells me is that um, Austin, uh, for Austin, a lot less people within Austin are looking other places. And a lot more people from outside of Austin are looking at Austin. Um, on the on the converse, um, a lot more people in Cleveland are looking places other than Cleveland, and a lot less people from out. Actually, it's not a lot less, but less people um, outside of Cleveland are looking at Cleveland. Uh, so that that data has been pretty helpful in um, determining what what renters are actively looking for. Now, in terms of how is you know how does this compare to last year? Search volume is actually uh, up a, up a lot since March. Uh, so in March we had a pretty sharp dip in search volume, uh, which of course is predicated on the on the lockdown and, and the fear of this virus and um, uh, the, the general uh, distress that we were seeing. But it came back to roughly where it had been in February and like mid-April, and uh, now it's it's at, at least 20% higher than than where it started, uh, than where that dip started. So what I have my my conclusion I think is that uh, it looks like people are people are looking other places a lot more. So it's it's kind of a grass is always greener. Uh, an, our conclusion, um, which is to say that, that renters didn't, renters always looked other places, obviously. Um, but right now, I think people are looking at other metros a lot harder uh, because if they, you know, if they've lost a job or if they feel like their metro is uh, uh, under particular strain from this virus, uh, they're they're looking other places. Now it's. It's obviously, like I said, it's worse in some metros than uh, than others. Um, you know, it, as I mentioned, San Diego, Austin, and Raleigh, people are actually looking other places less. Uh, but most places are looking at other metros more than they were. Um, so I, I would say that that this has made renters more antsy and more willing to to look at a different metro. Right, right. We we talked a little bit about Boston earlier, and I've got a question here on Boston. But I mean, personally, we like Boston. You know, it's one of the biotech hubs. I think that biotech is only going to get you know more important to the the country as a result of COVID. And there's some really interesting things going on there. But w- what's the data on Boston telling you? Are there are there a lot of people looking to move there? People looking to move out of there? What's that data showing? Boston's actually kind of middle of the road. Um, it's uh, it, it's seen as I said, you know, when everyone is looking outside of their metro um so boston's seen an increase 
uh, in people outside of the metro looking at it, but it's also seen an increase in people inside of Boston looking other places. And I think, so this is always, uh, what I'm about to describe is always kind of the case, um, despite the fact, you know, that New York is a huge metro, right? Um, Worcester and Providence are right next to Boston. So um, a, a lot of apartment or a lot of renter searches for Boston come from, from Worcester and Providence. Um, so there's there's been a pretty big uptick in people in Boston looking at uh, Worcester and, and Providence and Portland, Maine. Um, but so that that would be those would be strong arguments in favor of remote work uh remote workers looking outside of the metro and looking to go someplace else um but truth be told a lot of those metros have also greatly increased their um searching for boston um so it it feels like uh, you know from a search perspective obviously searches don't necessarily indicate that anyone's moved right but from a search perspective it it kind of just feels like a game of musical ch- or uh yeah musical chairs, let's say, where everyone's just kind of moving one to the right. Um, so the, the searches outside of Metro for that region have greatly increased, but uh, it's not to the benefit of any one particular Metro. Got it. Makes sense. We, we've talked about some of the major markets. What about smaller markets? You know, l- let's talk about what secondary and tertiary markets that you think are going to perform best. So, you know, I, I, I will admit that uh, we have a little bit of a, a bias towards larger markets, right? So, like, I, I even consider um, our, a lot of our, our clients and a lot of our thinking would consider, uh, like, Raleigh and Austin secondary or even tertiary markets. But, um, you know, when, when we when we look at the smaller metros, uh, like, a lot of them, it, I, I would say that there's not a lot of high outperformance on, on the uh, on the high-frequency data that, that we're looking at. So, um and a lot of it's tied to the nearby, you know, where there is outperformance or underperformance. A lot of it's tied to the to the nearby metro. Um, so McAllen, for instance, uh, well, McAllen's pretty far from Austin, but um, based, you know, based on what I've seen, um, McAllen and Austin are actually tied pretty closely on how they perform within our daily rent series and our uh, and our apartment search data. Um, so. I, I think that when you're talking about smaller metros, a lot of times you have to look at the nearby major metros. Right. Makes sense. What, what about Richmond, Virginia? So cheaper cost of living than Washington, D.C., you know, government jobs, great universities. What, what's your thought on, on mm-hmm. the Richmond market? Yeah, uh, Richmond's benefited from, um, you know, that, that lower regulatory burden and uh the proximity to DC and um, those universities already, and I, I would I would anticipate that it continues to do so. Um, uh, CoStar actually moved its research uh, capacity from DC to Richmond for exactly those reasons. Um, so you know, in in some respects, I might have a little bit of a bias towards being bullish on Richmond, um, but uh, I, I think that that was you know that was obviously a business decision that we made. And I think that's a business decision some other companies are going to make as well. Uh, Cause it is, it's not that far from, from DC where we're headquartered and uh, you know, a lot of companies um, I think are going to, are going to see those positives. Right. So we talked about Cleveland, you know, in longer term decline, doing worse in terms of search volume through apartments.com. You know, what, what about Columbus? Is Columbus, you know, going to be the outperformer in Ohio? Yeah. Uh, like easily. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Columbus, of course, has a, a major university. Um, it's actually got a pretty big, uh, like fashion, um, industry, which I, I don't, I'll, I'll admit, I don't really know the history of that, but, um, yeah, I, I do know that it's, that it's there. And, um, Columbus is like this interesting test market, um, for like fashion and, and food, uh, which is, uh, all, all things that, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily associate with that Midwest market that I kind of learned over the years. Um, but yeah, the demographics in Columbus uh, are much better than the Midwest in general. And I believe they're a little bit better than, than even the nations. So uh, they probably hew pretty close to average, but yeah. Um, and so far as Ohio goes, uh, I would definitely say Columbus is the um, outperformer there, which is, 
not necessarily hard when uh, you're up against Akron or, or uh, Youngstown. Right, right. Although major property taxes. So anytime you, have, you underwrite in Ohio, make sure that you uh, underwrite property taxes accurately because that one can be very scary. Um, what about enough. Salt Lake City? Let's talk Let's talk Utah. You and I were chatting about it a little bit uh, before we, we broadcast today. So share with us your thoughts on, on Salt Lake City. Yeah, so I, I do think that Salt Lake City is uh, a little bit more of a get pushed to market than a um, pull market. So Austin, uh, I guess I should stop talking about Austin. Um, but uh, a lot of some secondary markets have more of a, a pull um, factor if if they if you consider uh, regulatory burdens and um, taxes and uh, this, you know a, a knowledge base. Um, I think that Salt Lake City is more of a cheaper market that benefits when things get very expensive in uh, the core coastals that are nearby. And uh, I, I think that Boise saw a big boost off of that. Uh, I think Salt Lake City saw a pretty noticeable boost off of that. Um, so Boise and Salt Lake are, are two that I would expect to regress for a while. Interesting. We talked a little bit at the earlier portion today about Denver. You know, it's not in in kind of your top mm-hmm. three markets, but you know, it's a growth market. Um, what do you think about in and around Denver? So, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins. Any perspective on on those markets around Denver? You know, I, I wouldn't say that I, I know as much about um, those those nearby uh, metros as as I. Uh, do about you know Denver uh, specifically. Um, I, I I guess at the risk of sounding uninformed, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't really know uh, what to comment on those. Truth be told, got it. But Denver itself, you like? Yeah, um, you know you you mentioned that Denver wasn't in my top uh, top three, but it's probably in my top five. Hmm. Um, it's 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 still a it's still a growth market and it still has a pretty good knowledge base and it's it's been doing well. Um, and I would, I, I think it is one of the markets that will um, do well through uh, a slowdown. So we got uh, in your top five, I've got Austin, Raleigh, Charlotte, Denver. What's the last one? Yeah, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm not sure I'd know, uh, you know, perfectly well, but, uh, if I had to pick something, uh, I could go Dallas. Dallas. Certainly one of the certainly one of the southern uh, growth markets. Got it. We haven't talked much about Florida, and you've seen a lot of population growth in Florida, a lot of retirees moving here, and also a lot of folks moving because of the tax treatment, right? No state income tax. Oh yeah. Obviously, you know, we, we did talk about Orlando and and hospitality in Orlando, but. What do you think about Florida in general? What do you think about Miami? I mean, I've been reading the data on Miami and it's pretty bleak, right? There's been uh, rent decreases. I think it had the largest rent decreases of the country last month, uh, you know, maybe speaking to oversupply. So question on sort of Florida, Miami, and then we have a specific question from an investor here about the Florida Keys, which is more of a resort market. I'm not sure if you have a position on that or not, but if you do, just weave it in if you wouldn't. Yeah, I I just... um... On the on the, I, I guess I'll just start with the with the keys because um, you know it, it falls in the same uh, short term risk as uh, Orlando or, or Vegas um, because you know again people will not only are not only are people scared right now but they will be scared in the future for uh, some time and and we don't expect you know immediate return uh, to uh, let's say I mean, we'll call it normalcy. We don't expect an immediate return to normalcy for those those tourism market markets. Um, so Key West, unfortunately, does does fall in that. Um, but Florida, in general, uh, I think that there. So all right, I'll, I'll I'll comment first on on what I you know what I solidly know, uh, which is that these uh, the the search data for uh, Florida has neither outperformed nor underperformed it's it's more or less in the middle um I, I think some markets are doing a little worse miami actually i am sure is doing a little worse but it's not like a it's not an enormous outperform or underperformer um, and i think a lot of them like, like i said orlando's actually surprised me with its resiliency um and then to your uh 
to your point about rent, I actually think San Francisco has done the done the worst on uh, rent through this, but um, Miami has has not done particularly well either because it does have that uh, a good amount of uh, oversupply. Um, again, it's it's a question of you know long term versus short term. Um, in the next two years, yeah, Florida uh, Florida will probably not do as well as it as it had been, um, and a lot of that growth, like you said, was from retirees. Uh, I, I would anticipate, and this, so this is more speculative. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any hard numbers on this, but I would anticipate that retirees are are going to uh, slow down their their movement um, because they are more exposed to uh, this pandemic. Uh, it's it's kind of a behavioral thing that you can't necessarily capture in, uh, like I said, you, you can't capture those behavioral changes in, in forecasts. Um, but I, I do think that's going to be a factor for Florida. But again, it's it's a long term versus short term thing. And uh, like you said, those those income taxes in Florida are extremely attractive. Yeah, zero percent is nice when you're talking about taxes. So, so definitely. Yep. You mentioned the Bay Area. So thanks for the the correction that the the rent um, decline in the Bay Area was worse than the rent decline in in Miami. What do you think about kind of the the greater Bay Area, San Jose, Mountain View, you know, obviously San Francisco, we talked about a little bit, but sort of short term and long term, you know, I've been reading things about overbuilding. We obviously just talked about the rental declines, you know, a lot of the the big tech companies that have announced that they're allowing remote work, you know, are companies that are in San Jose, companies that are in Mountain View. But it sounds like the apartments.com data of people trying to move out of the Bay Area has not been that dramatic. So wh where are you thinking the Bay Area lands in all of this? So this is this is where we kind of get into a shortcoming with uh, uh, with with the way that I've been processing the data, um, because it is uh, I, I have to look at the Bay Area and I can't look at San Francisco versus San Jose versus Oakland. This is where I really think that um, the difference between total remote working and, re and work from home um, is coming into play uh, because we have seen those huge, uh, we have seen, well, I shouldn't say huge, but we have seen the biggest rent declines in San Francisco. Um, but at the same time, the Bay Area search data has not been, uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't really been terrible. Um, like I said, we've had a bigger, uh, we, we've had more people looking outside of the Bay Area, but we've also had more people looking at the Bay, Bay Area from out from outside it. So it's it's again that kind of little musical chairs uh, uh, issue. Um, the we, I, I've had I've had clients you know uh, reach out to us and, and say, hey, like we are really worried about the Bay Area. And one thing, there's there's one particular caveat that I, I think is is really worrisome for some Bay Area uh, landlords, and that is the H-1B restrictions, um, because the Bay Area is a huge, huge uh, uh, recipient of H-1B um, visas. So it it is entirely possible that landlords that are are uh, overexposed or are, are very exposed to H-1B renters um, could really feel a pinch there. Um, but, uh, as I was saying, sorry, as a, to get back to that, that track about remote working versus, uh, just work from home, this would be a situation where I think that people in San Francisco, um, are anticipating a higher percentage of their work being work from home. Um, and so they are looking to San Jose or Oakland, um, which are further out and cheaper. Uh, but if they are anticipating that they don't have to commute as much, um, then it becomes worth it to go out to those, uh, those those further away areas. And you may also see an increase in what we refer to as super commuters, which is people that uh, come in from as far as Sacramento. Right, right. Yeah, very interesting. Getting a question here on Albuquerque and Santa Fe, I know you predominantly cover the major markets, Andrew, but wondering if you have any thoughts on either of those smaller markets. Yeah, um, I, I I think it, uh, it actually I have looked at Albuquerque specifically in the past, um, so we'll just comment briefly on that. Um, I, the demographics there are, are not quite as strong as I had anticipated when I you know, first looked at it, um, but it is it does still have some of those uh, 
those growth market benefits. But um, I, in, in general, no, I, I would say that I don't know a ton about those markets. One question here on on student population are, are in your forecasts. Are you projecting that there's going to be a return to you know the Big Ten colleges or maybe even beyond that, all colleges? When you think about you know population in the market, and obviously a lot of the markets that you've talked about have been very heavy education, right? Where you've got universities, yeah. you've got talent, you've got knowledge workers. What what are you using as the inputs in your pro formas or projections around if people actually go back physically to school this upcoming school year? So again, that's that's kind of one of those behavioral changes that um, it, it's it's very you know difficult to to forecast based on uh, you know based on history. Um, the one so the the historical trend that I'll you know this uh, this the positive um, that I'll start with is that in recession in the last recession we saw a lot of people go back to school, um, especially for secondary degrees or uh, advanced degrees. Um, so that is something that I would anticipate uh, in this recession as well. Um, I, I would think that a lot of people who find their job permanently lost um, will uh, go back to school for retraining. Um, so that is that's obviously a positive for uh, student housing. But um, how much you know how much will colleges insist on virtual learning um, uh, and and how much will students kind of take to virtual learning is definitely a, a question that uh, doesn't have a perfect answer right now um, I know that uh, I know some colleges have already canceled fall semesters perhaps prematurely um, and that that's obviously a, a huge uh, ding for for student housing um, I I I think in general I, I I don't focus on the on the sector enough to really know what's going to happen though. Yeah, makes sense. As far as we, we talked a little bit at the top of the hour about price declines and speaking, you know, across asset classes, whichever you're comfortable with. Question here around how how bad do you think it's going to get, right? And and when do you think that's coming? So there's been uh, the Federal Reserve has been propping up the economy, right? We have increased unemployment mm -hmm. checks that right now are slated to go until the end of July. You know, there's been a, a lot of optionality around mortgage forbearance from the agencies. Uh, you've seen stimulus checks directly into the pocket of, you know, U.S. citizens. If that starts to relax, I mean, when do you see a lot of the stress in the market to come because i can tell you you know we're in the market every day we're trying to find things to buy we're trying to find things to invest in and i wouldn't say that we're seeing a huge amount of distress yet right maybe you're seeing pricing off five percent six percent seven percent kind of if you're lucky any sense of you know when that distress might be coming how long of a lag there may be you know and kind of the impact of all of these government support programs yeah, so the the lag last time was uh, was pretty long. You know, it was it was over a year, um, but uh, it's I, I would say that the mark. I, well, I don't know. I, I guess I can't speak for anyone else, but I am holding my breath for the end of July um, for when that unemployment insurance uh, runs out. Um, you know, the uh, everyone who is reporting rent collections for apartment has been reporting good rent collections for apartment. Um, but we do, so first I would say that a lot of those rent collections are going to be, uh, uh, leaning towards higher end, um, apartment buildings, which I, most, you know, certainly NMHC, um, has comment, you know, has, has made that comment many times. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've acknowledged that, uh, but a lot of the job losses that we saw, uh, happened in, uh, Industries that that don't pay that don't pay a lot, uh, low, lower income industries. So you know, retail and hospitality are uh, two of the lowest paid industries in, in the nation, and that's where a lot of that uh, a lot of those job losses came. Now, I do think that the you know the CARES Act uh, through both the stimulus and the uh, 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 the increased unemployment insurance papered over a lot of that pain. 
Um, but at the end of J July, if there is no replacement, uh, yeah, that, that could really start hitting things. And that, I think, is when um, you start seeing more distress. Now, in some other property types, um, I think there already has been, well, I shouldn't say I think, there has been distress already in, um, in the debt, uh, especially the CMBS markets. Um, and to some degree, uh, people have already, you know, snapped that up. Um, but uh, retail in particular is, is obviously a uh, key issue uh, in, in that distress market um, discussion. Uh, the the uh, rent collections that um, NACREF and, and NAREED have been reporting are very low, like sub 40% low. Um, so that's... Uh, that's that's obviously a, a key area where we would expect distress. Um, but uh, to your point about what are you seeing, in, or you know, what am I seeing in the market right now? What are we measuring in the market right now? Not not much decline. Um, we we uh, we measure this based on a repeat sales index. Um, so it's it's a function of all right, what did this property sell for uh, this time compared to last time, and uh, the price gains. Um, have declined yeah the price the price gains have declined a little bit um in terms of uh, like compound annual growth but uh it, it's not it's not meaningful it's not enough to say okay this is a uh like clearly we're seeing a huge um gap in pricing um i think that that starts to show up more when you when you start seeing more distressed assets trade so the uh the transaction volume is extremely low right now, uh, you know, compared to last year or, or two years ago, or um, really any point in this in the latter half of the cycle. Transaction volumes are, are extremely low. Um, so the only things that are selling, I think, are very, uh, very solid investments. Um, I think as we start to see more distressed assets come to the market, um, and like I said, that, that could take a while. Uh, it could take a, a, at least a year. Um, then you, you start to see the pricing really get affected. Right, right. Makes sense. Well, thank you so much for spending part of your afternoon with us, Andrew. I, this is really enlightening, really interesting. I want to do a quick recap for our listeners um, and correct me if I you know recap anything incorrectly here. But the, the major markets that I heard are sort of poised to pop or poised to do well are Austin, Raleigh, Charlotte, Denver, and Dallas. On the Destined yep. to Doom, I heard some concerns about short-term and, and some being long-term. Houston, Vegas, mm -hmm. Reno being short-term. Cleveland and St. Louis being more long-term. And then on the secondary yep. market side, I heard you know potential for outperformance in Richmond, Virginia, and Columbus, Ohio. Yes, yeah. Um, and the one other one that I would I would add to that uh you know the more positive list would be san diego um, which like i said the the high frequency data there has just been pretty positive right right and the biotech presence as well which is um i think moving that market as well yep so i'm going to give you one final question if you could pick okay. one market to deploy a hundred percent of your capital in the next two years what market would you pick so i'll uh, i just want to say that i like Nobody from Austin pays me anything. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't have any, you know, uh, vested interest in Austin. But uh, I, I do. I do really think that that's a very strong market, um, both short term and long term. And uh, I, I think it's. I think it's a pretty good bet still. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I learned a lot. I hope that our listeners learned a lot, and we really appreciate it. And I hope that everyone. Stay safe, stays healthy, and keeps learning more about commercial real estate. It's it's been a joy having you on today, Andrew. Oh, thank you. And uh, you know, again, thanks a lot for having me. Wonderful. Take care. You too.